Magic is fun. And whenever magic appears in a book, series or a game, which naturally interests me the most, see the name of the channel, it's either governed or can be described as following a set of rules. Now, these rules can be unpredictable, difficult to discover, and seemingly contradictory, and we call that soft magic. For example, Gandalf's spells in Lord of the Rings. Or they can follow specific rule sets akin to magical physics or engineering with clearly explained scope, limits, and costs that are associated with a particular act of sorcery, like most systems used in Brandon Sanderson's books. This first part of the video is going to be generally about magic systems, especially ones seen through the lens of that hard soft divide, but in games specifically. This divide is a popular concept, a popular talking point, especially on YouTube, in discussions of literature, movies and TV shows, but I wonder how it fits when games are the medium that's under discussion. Now, I've got a lot of thoughts about this, and probably not all of them are correct, so I encourage you to let me know in the comments which takes of mine you consider absolute garbo. So, hard and soft magic. Hard and soft magic have a lot to do with authorial intent and the author's relationship with the reader, see Sanderson's first law. Now, this presents a clear guideline to how magic may be used narratively to solve or cause problems in the storyline, and it works very well in non-interactive media. But it's different in games. You have to take into account, apart from the relationship between the author and the reader, you have to take into account many other factors. For example, game balance is one of the additional narrative factors. The player's ability to solve problems that the game throws at them through magic or otherwise should always feel earned. And you can earn it in a couple of different ways, of course. The ability to solve a game's problems by applying any tool or collection of tools is going to need to be earned through mastering a skill as a player, getting good, as it's often referred to, maybe paying a cost like a resource, progressing through the game enough that would be an unlock, or just putting in the hours which would be grinding. And that's true for most problem-solving things a player can do, of course, like your basic attack also gets better with grinding or with unlocks, but it's especially true for magic systems. Because magic, both narratively and mechanically, often works laterally to the main axis of conflict in a game. If I'm told I can solve a problem with magic, I'm expecting more creative solutions, being able to bypass something, strike from afar when an enemy is trying to get into melee, maybe displace the enemy, debuff them, or perhaps strike preemptively. If the main problem-solving tool in my game is, say, jump or bonk, I'm expecting magic to give me a different solution. Often a more exciting one, because come on, we are not putting magic in our game and the visual spectacle that's often associated with it just for it to be the boring choice. If I were like Brandon Sanderson, by which I mean an accomplished fantasy author, I would probably call a summary of this concept Simon's Corollary or something. The ability to solve a game's problems ought to feel earned, but doubly so if they are to be solved by magic. So, it's not only or perhaps less about the viewer's understanding of magic that makes it justified in its problem-solving capacity, as much as it is about it being a fruit of one's hard work. The one in this context being the player. There is probably a cleaner way to structure that sentence, but if I was good at speaking to the point, I would write instruction manuals and not run a YouTube channel. So, soft magic. In my opinion, it's atypical for it to be used in games, at least as a game mechanic, because soft magic is usually better or at least more easily communicated through the narrative. It is very popular writing advice that soft magic is best observed through the eyes of mundane characters or maybe a newcomer to the arcane arts. If it's the former, and the game's soft magic is only private to the NPCs and only observed by the player but never used, then we can circumvent the whole discussion of magic as a problem-solving tool and all the balancing elements that come with it, this may be handy for a designer who doesn't want to tackle that particular beast, 
but still wants to have some magical elements in the setting. So if it's not in the hands of the players, magic will either be set dressing, as I mentioned, some designers want to have a magical setting but not magical mechanics, or it can be a problem creation tool. And indeed, it's been the conceit of many a game that the antagonist made use of some magical ability of unspecified power and origin to place a magical curse on the residents of the kingdom, making them decidedly less happy than they previously were. And of course, now our hero has to make liberal use of jump and bonk to reverse the curse, beat the villain and whatnot, and this ultimately leads to a confrontation that probably bypasses the need to deal with the villain's newfound powers and at its most magical has you dodging some attacks that have particle effects before you end the fight with a well-placed jump or bonk. Does soft magic follow a video gamified version of Sanderson's first law, or perhaps Simon's corollary? By which I mean, would it take away from player enjoyment if it were way more potent than feels earned or explained? I mean, yeah, for sure. The use of soft magic as an inciting incident is alright, because we are generally very lenient in how we judge the beginnings of stories. Something that wouldn't make sense in the middle or in the end is probably okay because we are all consciously or unconsciously aware that the story has to start somehow. That's the reason why the final boss very often seems to forget that they have access to magic that could trivialize dealing with the hero, or maybe through a strange twist of fate they lose access to their magical powers just before the boss fight, which of course could be used to the narrative's advantage as well. If you were to make the middle game about neutralizing that awesome magical power that the antagonist wields, let's say maybe the hero stands little chance against the boss and their awesome magical abilities, unless they gather for plot coupons that they can use to make that power go away, and then boom, you've got a JRPG narrative. The alternative is to put soft magic powers in the player's hands, of course, but that's also difficult as you're giving the player a problem-solving tool with largely unspecified capabilities. And this runs two risks. The obvious one is that it's going to be more powerful than feels earned or is expected, thus cheapening the feeling of solving problems with it. It's going to be OP compared to player expectation. But there's also the opposite problem, of it feeling lame by being less potent than the player expects. And we don't talk enough, I feel, that most writers in other media are quite adept at protecting the, their main characters and their skill sets from feeling lame, so it's not something that's often discussed, the opposite problem, if anything, is more often discussed, but it's a much bigger consideration in games. I've played multiple games where magic felt lame. And magic should be the exciting approach to problem solving. So if it lacks oomph, pizzazz and panache, well, maybe the character lacks panache, the magic lacks pizzazz, I guess, then it's going to negatively impact player enjoyment because their expectations are not going to be met. And, you know, unspecified capabilities run the risk of expectations being way over or way lower than the power level that magic actually has. So those balancing factors need to be kept in mind. Hard magic, on the other hand, works very well in the hands of player characters. Because at its core, hard magic is a system. Specifically, a system that relies on balancing the capabilities, limitations and costs of magic. Fortunately for us, any problem-solving tool that the developers provide the player with is also based on a system. It will have its vectors, hitboxes, variables, etc. And these translate rather easily into a player-facing system of less technical variables. Ones that specify very explicitly the capabilities, limitations and costs of wielding magic by the characters in a mechanical sense. Let's consider a popular problem-solving tool in any game with RPG elements, a skill. A skill has its set of capabilities, it may deal X damage, displace enemies a set amount, inflict a particular debuff or damage over time effect. It has its limitations both implicit, 
it can't deal more damage than it deals or inflict a different debuff than it inflicts, and explicit in the form of range, cooldowns, casting time, etc. It might have a cost in the form of resource, limited or refillable, and actually I consider having a cost associated with doing magic to be a boon to any magic system, hard or soft, but the costs of hard magic systems tend to be more quantifiable, more easy to express as a number. In its best applications, the game mechanics that are associated with a hard magic system work in tandem with the narrative elements of a hard magic system. For example, a mana bar represents energy that's an element of the game's universe. It could be discussed by the characters in the story, it will get longer as your character becomes a more accomplished magician and all. It also does very well in forming player expectation. Knowing the expected mechanical effect that's associated with a skill also informs you on how effective you will be when tackling the game's challenges with that skill. It's a reliable indicator. If the numbers seem good, you will probably feel good using it and it will probably make short work of any enemy in your path. In its worst applications, it risks ludonarrative dissonance. That's when the story and gameplay elements clash, each attempting to present a different narrative. A popular, if a bit nitpicky example would be healing magic, being used to bring characters from the brink of death in combat, even healing missing limbs, but sickness, dismemberment and death still being treated as a serious problem in cutscenes and questlines. That's an example of the capabilities of a mechanical expression of magic being inflated beyond the capabilities of the magic system that exists in the narrative. It's understandable, of course, because that inflation is often a result of a necessary quality of life change or an attempt to prevent magic and the player character from feeling lame. The narrative perils of wounds, death and disease are also very compelling and relatable narrative elements, so I get the decision to keep them in the story, even if they could theoretically be solved with a well-placed cure wounds or similar spell. So, as I mentioned, that's more of a nitpick and will probably not negatively impact player enjoyment unless it's very striking. Now, for the second part of the video, it's going to be specifically about how Cultist Simulator grapples with these concepts, laws, corollaries and other vague observations that I've enumerated. And let me tell you, I chose it specifically because I think it has fascinating answers to all these questions. Ones that are unlike anything I've seen before in a game. Also, if you fell prey to my first call to action and took the liberty of insulting my takes in the comments, this is your chance to redeem yourself by smashing that like button and maybe leaving me a subscription, much obliged as always. Of course, one of the best parts of Cold Sim is discovering the game's mechanics and quirks, so I may allude to the existence of some of them, but I'll do my best not to spoil anything substantial, so if you feel compelled to pick up the game after watching this video, I don't think you'll be spoiled on much. At least, so I hope. Cultist Simulator is a game that I'd call a card-based immersive sim. It allows you to explore a fantastic 1920s-inspired occult setting with a very dreamlike, slightly unsettling vibe. You will do so, explore I mean, via combining sets of cards that represent different narrative elements, from your character's health, to occult implements and books of lore, to other characters and places. These combinations will yield results in the form of new pieces of the game's excellent writing and potentially new cards, granting you access to new paths to explore. This exploration across the game's sprawling sandbox will ultimately culminate in your character reaching new heights of magical power or maybe a satisfyingly final death, sometimes both, with there being dozens of possible endings in both categories. But what I'm most interested in discussing is Cultist Simulator's magic system. And that magic is something that you started the game somewhat removed from. Based on the character origin that you chose, 
one of the inciting incidents leading to the creation of your cult and your personal rise to glory or road to ruin is your first contact with magic. In many cases, that first contact is beyond soft. Reading a manuscript or set of notes about magic that seems genuine at first glance or maybe starting to see unexplainable visions in your dreams, maybe meeting a person that's implied to wield magical powers, but there's never hard evidence at first. Magic is not something that's seen, observed or examined pseudo-scientifically in the game. It exists within the realm of belief, for both you and your character. And the only reason why that first manuscript, that piece of lore that started your occult career couldn't be a clever forgery is that A, it would be very lame narratively, and B, because there are non-diegetic elements that inform you otherwise. The UI informs you that it is indeed a low-potency magic item, the genuine article. To the point of and including your first magic ritual, the founding of your cult, the nature of magic in cult sim is quasi-religious, with the effects being comparable to placebo. And as I've mentioned before, soft magic is excellently presented from a newcomer's perspective, with the rules being revealed more and more as the main character learns more and more about it. So as you research further, and that will take both time and resources, you will see further proof of magic's reality. You will assemble a collection of magic items, remnants of powerful gods and demigods of ages past, but you still won't be able to use magic as a problem-solving tool. Coming back to Simon's Corollary, the first parts of the game are the process of earning your access to magic, and all the narrative trappings leading to being able to use it for problem-solving. You will read about magic, you will see the effects of magic existence on the world of Cultist Simulator, you will occasionally even have magic used upon you, but there are very few tangible uses that you will initiate. Your cult members may take actions that seem magical in expeditions or when asked to take care of problematic evidence or procure some magical curios, but these are not functionally different from stealing documents, whacking monks over the head or being a blacksmith. They do have a bit of magical poetry waxed on top, and there is the quasi-religious nature of all the rites that are used, but you could always explain that away with your cultists being just preternaturally gifted blacksmiths or monk whackers. So, when you get access to your first magical rite, it's a big deal. It may come as a surprise, that the magic system starts to harden a bit and become more functional in front of your very eyes. The rites will allow you to accomplish a variety of effects by combining magical forces of particular type and potency. Each rite requires a different set of costs to be met, expressed as different card slots that you can put cards in. So you may combine a piece of lore and influence, which is essentially a vibe given form, and a tool to complete the rite of Map's Edge, to bring the Baldomerian's attention to yourself. Or you may attempt the same thing using a human or corpse sacrifice. The interplay between these costs and capabilities of a particular ritual exists both in-universe and non-diegetically. Non-diegetically you are putting particular cards in that may be easier or harder to get access to, and in the universe, the ritual is expressed as requiring particular things or elements. So there is the game's rule set in which if you want to summon a creature of the Thunder skin to accomplish task X, like getting rid of a problematic rival, you'll have to find a combination of tools that will generate the necessary resources and fit a right that you have available. But that's just the mechanical skeleton, upon which are suspended the meat and skin of excellent thematicity. Because your character learns the rites in their specific form, 
it's not just you knowing that you need specific cards, it's the character knowing that the right of map's edge needs a tool. The descriptions, the provenience of the rights, their place and function in Cult Sims cosmology both stem from the mechanical expressions and also cause them. And I know that seems a bit circular, but many religious concepts are, and the early parts of the game equip you very well to understand quasi-religious concepts like these. Finally, after you've assembled a combination of magical accoutrements, of the right type and potency, you will be rewarded with a completely unique effect that no other cards before have provided. You may also be rewarded with cards that are a level or two above what you had access to before. You might have had cultists who had a shot at dealing with troublesome authority, but you'll see much more success if you send literal demons to handle that nasty business. So, when you're finally in the driver's seat of magic, you'll find that its way of solving problems is both unique and powerful. And that's my fantasy of what magic in games should be. It should be unique and powerful. But even though the game's system allows you to understand it enough to utilize it effectively, it never becomes too analytical. Magic is still unpredictable and dangerous, even when you're the one wielding it. The costs associated with it don't necessarily elude your understanding, but they never become quantified to the point of being mundane, of being engineering-like. A spell will still require, say, years of your lifespan or the body of a friend to cast, and never 65 mana. Cultist Simulator succeeds at the difficult task of giving the players access to a soft magic system that works well. There's just enough hardness in it to make you able to use it effectively and not an iota more. And due to the great writing and excellent positioning of the game's systems in the fiction, that proposition never feels obtuse like the developer is trying to obscure systems from you. The fact that magic is puzzling, dangerous, difficult and unpredictable is a direct consequence of how the cultist simulator world is built, and I wouldn't have it any other way. The descriptions of the effects of your magic that the magic brings into the world are not annoyingly vague, they are enthrallingly cryptic. And I'm aware that this is a value judgment, that the exact opposite may be true for a player that's less spellbound by the game than me, but I can bet that Cold Sim's excellent writing, mechanics and yeah, their choice of magic system as well, will make that group of people who are less spellbound less populous than the one that echoes my value judgment. Give the game a try, if what I've talked about has struck your fancy because I think it's well worth it. Thanks a lot for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.